Okay, I'd say let's go ahead and get started and see how we do. Bruce, you want to kick us off? Great. Welcome, everyone, to the COVID-19 One Health update for the Southeast Asia One Health University Regional Network. I'm Dr. Bruce Strumminger. I'm with Project ECHO at the University of New Mexico. And I'm just going to go through a few housekeeping and logistic issues. So we we're trying to create a community of practice among our One Health colleagues across the Southeast Asia region. So we really encourage you to turn on your camera if your bandwidth allows it so that we can have a virtual face-to-face -face meeting. We want you to turn on your camera, but we want you to keep your microphone muted unless you're speaking, just so that we can hear each other better. We'd also <coughs> like to rename yourself by going up to the, put your cursor over the top right corner of your Hollywood Square, and there are three little dots. And you can put your name and your organization and country so that we can get to know each other better and easier. There's a chat function in the bottom toolbar of the Zoom uh, window. And please chat with Echo IT if you're having any IT issues. We'll try to help you with those. Otherwise, use the chat for questions and comments. And we're, we're able to get your attendance uh, both by your signing in and we really encourage you to use the Socion uh, PDA participant app. Hopefully you saw that in the announcement and downloaded it. And to the right is a start QR code. And so we encourage you to go ahead and scan that using the PDA participant app. There's a download link in the announcement and we'll share that in the chat as well. And at the end of the session, I'll stay on for a few minutes to help anyone that might be having challenges with that. We'll also put up an end QR code at the end of the session and you'll get an attestation when you do that of your participation in this learning session. And you'll get access immediately to the PowerPoint presentations. We'll also be sharing those by an, through email in a follow-up email after the session. So everyone will get access to all the PowerPoints as well as a recording. And there will be a recording on the UC Davis One Health uh, website as well. And we'll share links to that in the chat. This session is being recorded and your attendance is consent to be recorded, so thank you for that. There will be continuing professional development credits available through the University of New Mexico. We will share a link in the chat at the end of the session and uh, you'll take a quick two-minute survey that will give us feedback so we can continue to improve what we're doing to support these learning sessions, and then you'll get an instant uh, CPD certificate. With that, I'm going to share the microphone back to Professor Smith at UC Davis. Sure, well, let me add my warm welcome and, and thank you to everyone for being here. Um, it's really a pleasure to continue our series of One Health Echo sessions, and um, we're looking forward to having a, a nice combination of international expert overview as well as regional expert uh, sharing of experiences and some nice panel discussions. So um, I don't think I'll take too long for, for my own pieces, but um, as the technical director for the USAID One Health Workforce Next Generation Program, we really enjoyed working with the Si Ohun Secretariat and the country Ohun teams and the various stakeholders to design activities that can help to build the workforce and be responsive to things like the COVID-19 pandemic. So I think these sorts of interactions and global engagement are very valuable and important. And I look forward to continuing to work with many of you on these types of things. Um, let me ask Pat to go ahead and share his initial thoughts on um, how things are going and we'll then kick off our session. Hi, right. so uh, welcome everyone uh, again uh, from the Southeast Asia One Hill University Network. So I am Pat Kurujitam, uh, executive, uh, executive director from the Southeast Asia One Hill University Network. Uh, this is our fifth session now, so we are uh, really uh, excited that you know everyone's keep coming back and joining us. And uh, uh, today's session is on the, the diagnostic uh, testing. So we are pleased to co-host that with the One Hill Workforce uh, Next Generation team. 
uh, uh, leading by the University of California at Davis. So we, we know that you know, uh, generally more, more testing doesn't uh, turn out to be that you know, we're going to curve out uh, the, the flattening the curve and, and, and you know, having a better response uh, to the, the, the COVID-19 outbreak. Uh, so today, uh, not only that we're going to hear from the, the, the global perspective, uh, we also hear from our uh, Southeast Asia expert in the three countries. So from Malaysia, Thailand, and Vietnam that, you know, how this country are doing and how they actually uh, are doing quite quite well in terms of the, uh, their, their responses in terms of uh, testing, tracing, and, you know, addressing the outbreak. So with that, uh, we'd like to give it short uh, because uh, we like to leave ample time for discussion. So I like to turn the floor to uh, Dr. Brian Burke, uh, who's going to provide us uh, with the overview uh, of the, the, the COVID-19 and uh, introduce our speakers. Brian? All right. Thank you, Dr. Pat. That's wonderful. And it's delightful to be back with everyone again for our fifth session. It's hard to believe, but we're now in the fifth ECHO session for the One Health Workforce. And I think it's a wonderful opportunity for us to share our experiences and our uh, work together on trying to uh, overcome this pandemic that we're all in. So let me share my screen. I have just very brief updates today because today we're talking about uh, a topic that is uh, most important to my own self, uh, being a diagnostician, having worked in several countries across Africa, working on human diagnostics during outbreaks when I was with the CDC and now leading part of our outbreak responses under One Health Workforce and other programs from the One Health Institute at UC Davis. And I'm delighted to have a great panel of speakers uh, from FIND, Dr. Jillian Sachs, who will give us a global overview of the situation with diagnostics developments, then Dr. Bakar from Malaysia, Dr. Ponsawan from Thailand, and Dr. Nguyen from Vietnam. I think it'll be a great session, and I'm really looking forward to hearing everyone's questions and perspectives on how they are doing diagnostics in support of the pandemic response in your own countries. So since we last talked just two weeks ago, there are again more than one million cases recorded across the world. In the Sayahun countries, there's about 42,000 cases now. Uh, and only one late breaker interesting fact this time to keep the, the remarks short is that yesterday there was the first uh, what appears to be confirmed transmission of SARS-2 coronavirus from a farmed animal, a farmed mink, which is a small creature that is grown for its fur, in the Netherlands from that animal to a person. Uh, the data is still sparse at the moment, but it does seem like perhaps for that particular animal, there may have been animal to human transmission. And you can see a link there in my slide, and that would link you to the, the, the health report from the Ministry of Health of the Netherlands to get more information. And I'm sure as the outbreak goes on, we will find out more and more as uh, time goes on and more people are involved in the pandemic. Okay? And as always in my slides, the last slide here is a link to many, many different resources that I try to update each week. Uh, to include places where you can find good factual information. Okay, well enough from me. Let's hear from our, our panelists. So I'm going to stop my share and turn it over to Dr. Jillian Sachs, who uh, will now take us through the global perspective on uh, diagnostics and the great work they're doing at FIND. So please, Dr. Sachs. Great. Thank you very much for the introduction and the opportunity to speak to you all today. Um, just, um, sorry, not sure. There we go. Um, I think you can see my slides now. Yeah. Uh, uh, Dr. Sachs, we're seeing the presenter mode. If you switch uh, view okay. or switch screens, upper uh, right corner, um, it'll flip it to where we see just the big, the, the one slide. Okay. Sorry about that. That's okay. Um, display settings, is this right? Maybe that one. Can... Does that work? Mm -hmm. huh. Not quite, Jillian. But no, go, no, okay. Go back and try the other option there. See if that works. I'm sorry. That's a... Perhaps I can just do that. That work? Hmm. I'm not sure. I'm not sure either. Bruce, Make, what give, give one more try with presentation mode. Yeah. 
click that. Whoop, no, that's taking it back. One more try at the display settings and. Sure thing. Okay. And then duplicate slideshow, but do the oh, Duplicate, okay. So. Yeah, that, worked. that worked, what you did. This that worked? worked. Yes. Yeah, okay, we're good. Okay, yay. Okay, <laughs> sorry. Um, well, apologies for the bumpy start there, but um, nice to join you all. Um, and I um, am presenting on behalf of FIND, which is the Foundation for Innovative New Diagnostics. Um, and I've prepared quite a high level overview and introduction on diagnostics um, to, to introduce this topic to um, a wide variety of audience members. So just to set the stage, which I think all of you are very familiar with um, and kind of gives a justification as to why diagnostics are really critical, um, we recognize that um, th there are critical health infrastructure uh, capacity issues that are happening worldwide. So this is um, one of the first instances where um, pretty much every single country globally is trying to diagnose the same exact disease. So um, we know that adequate testing capacity for SARS-CoV-2 is lacking worldwide. Um, and because of the way this epidemic has started, emerging cases in Europe and the US have definitely overwhelmed the health systems of such high income countries. And then we're also seeing that in more resource limited settings, um, such as Africa, Latin America, and some countries in Southeast Asia, they could be quite vulnerable to this uh, disease because of their already fragile healthcare systems. So FIND, which I said is the Foundation for Innovative New Diagnostics, is a global nonprofit. We're based in Geneva, Switzerland, um, and we work to drive diagnostic innovation. And we have several different um, program areas, one of which is pandemic preparedness. Um, so what we've been doing for the past few months to support the global COVID-19 response is um, we're conducting rapid evaluations of tests for SARS-CoV-2, um, especially tests that are prioritized for use in low and middle income country settings. Um, the goal of the data that we're generating is to enable countries to make procurement decisions of high quality and high performing tests. Um, we are also working directly with partners to build capacity in laboratories uh, to enable rapid scale up of diagnostics. Um, we also are monitoring the pipeline of new products um, to highlight products that are most fit for purpose um, in the settings in which we are focused. And then we um, are also partnering with some um, groups to com help complete the development of new diagnostic assays that might fill a gap. So just as a background and to set the stage, um, I'll just summarize some information that the World Health Organization has put out um, to uh, state the goal of testing for COVID-19. Um, and it depends on the epidemic context in which you're uh, discussing. So in countries that have very few cases or experiencing clusters of cases, the goal really is to stop transmission and to prevent spread um, so that you don't become a country that has ongoing community transmission. Um, if unfortunately you, you are a country that is experiencing community transmission, then the goal for testing is really to slow transmission, reduce your case numbers, and to end that community outbreak so that you then can um, contain the epidemic more appropriately. As well, the goal is to um, not just focus on your healthcare system, but you do have to um, try to minimize the impacts on your social and economic uh, well being in your country. So, who should be tested for COVID? Um, Right now, there is a need to use both clinical factors, so symptoms, as well as ep epidemiological factors, which would be um, exposure to the uh, virus, to ascertain the likelihood of infection and then conduct testing. So um, it is recommended that PCR testing, uh, which I'll discuss briefly shortly, um, should be done perhaps on asymptomatic or mildly symptomatic people who are contacts um, of those who were already diagnosed with COVID. Um, as well, it is advised that there's rapid collection and testing for patients meeting suspected case definition. Um, so that has to do with the symptoms that they display and the severity of them. And this is a priority for clinical management as well as outbreak control. So as a high level overview of um, the diagnostics that are currently available, there are molecular tests, which are also called nucleic acid tests, which directly detect the presence of the virus through its genetic material or RNA. 
there are immunoassays, which can either be detection, which can either detect antibodies that the um, host immune response, that is part of the host immune response um, to the virus itself. And then there are immunoassays that detect antigen um, in which the presence of viral proteins or antigens that are generated as the virus replicates can be detected. Um, this again would also indicate active infection. And then there are also non-disease specific tests um, that can ascertain signs and symptoms of COVID. An example of this might be thermal scanning to identify people with fever, um, as well as imaging such as CT scans. So Thank when you. we talk about, yeah. So um, in, in seeing your slides, they're, they're yeah. cut off on one side. And for many of them, it doesn't matter. But for this one especially, it would okay. be really lovely for everyone to see the full slide. Do you want to just go um, go out and go back in? And we'll see if we can make it work to, yeah, like that would probably actually be better. OK, no problem. We can see the whole thing. So can you still so advance sorry. from that view? Yeah, I'm fine. Um, I apologize that this is causing such an issue. No, no, that's um, that's okay. Go ahead and try that, and then I think everyone will be able to work with it. And if we have a really small one, then we'll figure it out. Okay, that looks great. go ahead. Great. Um, so as I was saying, and and apologies for the uh, technical difficulties. Um, so molecular tests, which detect RNA, um, are usually done through a process called uh, polymerase chain reaction or PCR, as well as there's possibility to do isothermal amplification, um, in which a small amount of genetic material is is rapidly amplified. Um, these uh, tests are usually lab-based, um, and obviously this, this is the bread and butter of testing right now. It, it, it's the, the most important test um, of people suspected of having COVID-19. Um, the immunoassays that I mentioned are usually based on a technique called enzyme-linked immunosorbent assay, or ELISA. They can be in different formats, one of which is the lateral flow or a rapid diagnostic test. Um, or there can be machine-based um, automated or manual systems. Um, and because of the different test formats, these immunoassays can either be lab-based or can be deployed at the point of care. Um, generally, the antibody-based immunoassays are the best biomarker to estimate the number of people who are previously infected with the virus, um, but they also may be considered as a complementary test for diagnosis. For example, um, if you have access to both PCR and antibody, there are some uh, individuals who you um, may not detect uh, through PCR, but you could diagnose them through antibody. Um, as well, there are antigen-based tests, um, and these uh, are most appropriate for testing people suspected of having COVID. Um, they also could be used perhaps to triage um, individuals who are suspected and then identify them for further testing. Um, and lastly, the non-disease specific tests that I mentioned are most appropriate for screening and triage to then identify the candidates for further testing. So they wouldn't diagnose COVID on their own. Um, when thinking about testing, it's important to consider what sample type we're talking about. So right now, nasopharyngeal swabs are, are the most common uh, sample type used for molecular and antigen-based testing. Um, other sample types that may be included include um, sputum, if the patient is, is able to cough it up. Um, blood can be used for antibody testing. Um, there's some data showing that saliva is a good sample type. Um, there's uh, still more data needed on the use of stool and or urine as a sample type. And then um, you can also do a bowel collection, um, but that's quite invasive um, and, and could pose a biosafety risk. Um, samples are able to be taken perhaps at home if there's the uh, situation where you have a visiting healthcare professional um, in many countries, there are now drive-through centers where the nasopharyngeal or the oropharyngeal swabs can be taken through your car window, um, as well, most commonly at a, at a healthcare facility, samples may be collected, which then can be sent to a laboratory for testing. Um, right now, there aren't that many tests that can be deployed directly at the point of care, but I think there are more developing. Um, so I think it's important when we talk about testing for, for uh, SARS-CoV-2, um, to, to think about the biomarkers that we're testing for. So it's imp this um, cartoon shows uh, very nicely um, the kinetics of the different biomarker expression um, and also um, shows it according to different sample types. Um, and this is from a recent JAMA article. Um, so just a few things to highlight about SARS-CoV-2 that are important to note. Um, obviously it is a respiratory pathogen, not a bloodborne pathogen. Um, and so that is why most of these sample types are, are respiratory based. Um, the, 
Um, I think there's a little interference perhaps. Um, and then the immune response may be quite atypical to SARS-CoV-2, um, generally with other viral pathogens. Um, IgM, which is a particular type of antibody, um, is detectable in the blood early uh, post-infection and, and might be an indi indication of active infection and then wanes. Um, that's not the case right now, it seems, for SARS-CoV-2. So both IgM and IgG antibodies rise together um, after the first few days of infection. Um, and it's also important to note that there may be high levels of virus in this early period before symptoms uh, are uh, detectable. Um, and trying to um, find people in this window period, in this early period, is, is, is challenging. Um, so this is just an overall summary table um, of different use cases for COVID-19 testing and which test types might be most appropriate for them. Um, this is not an exhaustive list, but just gives you a, a flavor for the different um, uses for each of these test types. So confirmation of active infection would mean that you use the test on only that one test to diagnose COVID. Um, triaging of suspect cases is important um, to either rule in COVID-19 or rule it out, depending on the um, performance of the test. Um, there's also tests that can be used to monitor disease progression. So you can monitor someone using PCR to figure out when their viral load falls. Um, and then, uh, as I mentioned earlier, antibody testing could be used as a complementary test to help diagnose cases um, that are presenting late. Um, screening contacts for infection, uh, likely antigen RDTs might be the most appropriate for that. Um, PCR would be very good, but it may be impractical to be able to implement this if you have constraints in your um, lab system. And then screening contacts for exposure um, is best done using an antibody-based test, and that's what antibodies um, indicate. And then, uh, as I mentioned earlier, antibody-based tests are most appropriate for population surveillance. Um, so I wanted to just uh, summarize the fact that there are a lot of tests for COVID-19 that are commercially available. So um, one thing that FIND is currently doing is we're monitoring the pipeline of tests, and I just um, pulled some information uh, yesterday from our pipeline um, and just summarize the number of tests and the number of unique companies for each of these test types. Um, so th there's a lot to choose from, and so it's important to think about what characteristics you would use uh, to select your particular product. Um, I've added here a lot of different references that um, you can find information on the actual performance, so sensitivity and specificity of these tests. Um, which you can look up after the presentation. Um, so once you think about what you actually want to use a test for, it's important to select a specific product. And as I just showed you, there's many to choose from. So um, it is, the, here are just a few guiding principles that might help to set, uh, 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 to select specific products. So um, it is important to prioritize tests that have gone through some sort of national emergency use authorization. Um, but it should be noted that different countries have very different requirements. Um, so uh, just because something's approved in one country, it may, it may not be suitable for your particular setting. Um, it's important to select countries that meet international quality standards so that they can provide you with consistent products. Um, it is helpful to prioritize tests that already have existing distributor or supply networks in your country because especially right now with um, uh, global transport being quite disrupted. It, it is hard to get tests if, if there isn't an already an existing distributor system. Um, as I noted, it's also important to understand the sample collection materials that you would need to run a particular test, um, as well as any other ancillary equipment that is and, and supplies that are not that are required to run the test, but um, may not be provided by the test supplier. Um, again, because global supply chains are quite uh, constrained right now, um, any additional reagents that you would have to source um, uh, is, are, are, are quite, can be quite challenging since every country is trying to source the same things. Um, and lastly, it's important to ask suppliers for a copy of their instructions for use before implementing their test if possible so that you can understand what you need to roll out that test appropriately. Um, and uh, lastly, consulting independently generated performance data um, we're generating some of that, and, and there are many other groups out there as well that are doing that, um, both academic and governmental. So it's important to consult that information um, before you select a test. Um, so one final note uh, before I close is that 
Um, we have partnered with the African Society of Laboratory Medicine as well as the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine um, to uh, create a um, online learning platform focused on COVID-19. Um, we launched our first session of this course um, in April, um, and it's a three week long course. Uh, the next course run is set to launch in mid-June. So if you want to learn more about diagnostics and testing, I would encourage you to um, participate in this free online course. Um, so with that, I will close and thank you for um, your attention and the opportunity to present. Um, and here's just a listing of some of our funders. And if you have questions, please feel free to contact us at the um, outbreaks at findx.org uh, email address listed here. All right, thank you, Dr. Sachs, for that great overview <clears throat> and approach to how we should think about diagnostic tests and the, the utility and usefulness of different tests at different times in the clinical uh, course for our patients. Uh, I think in, so we can get to the discussion. I have a few questions for you, but I'm gonna hold those till after the pre other presenters have uh, spoken. And it looks like Dr. Bakar from Malaysia has not been able to join us. So Dr. Ponsawan from Thailand, do you, could you uh, give us your insights uh, from Thailand? Sorry to, to move you up a notch, but it seems like uh, maybe prof uh, Professor Bakar is having some difficulties joining. So please. Uh, it looks like you might be muted. Uh, okay. He, hello. Yes. Can, we can you hear? Us? Yes, please. Thank you. Okay. Um, yeah, it is my pleasure and um, great honor to share our experience from our hospital in Thailand. Um, actually, um, as everyone knows that um, we use the molecular assay to uh, diagnostic of SARS-CoV-2 for our hospital. We use um, at least two test kit of the real-time PCR to confirm each other. So um, we check for ORF1, AB, and NGIN as usual. So if the, um, one, the first test kit gives the I mean, clear result, this is fine. But once um, the result shows something like um, inconclusive or um, it is above um, 38 um, cycles, sometimes we confirm again with another test kit from another company, which also use um, ORF1B and NGIN. Mm -hmm. Okay, and um, the cutoff is of over 40 um, cycles, and also we check every time with the positive control and negative control. Yeah, and the, um, the copy number, the limitation of detection here, we use around um, 200 copies per ml for the test kit. Another um, technique that um, introduced to um, our country right now, I mean, um, LAM, actually, we know it a lot, but LAM for COVID-19 um, um, also launched by our, uh, one of our um, hospital, Ramatipati Hospital, they start to use um, the test kit um, for the remote area. Also, uh, they have some kind of um, field test in the um, province at the eastern part of Thailand already and it worked very well. So I think a uh, lamb is one of the choice if we would like to use it in the um, the hospital that cannot um, afford for the real-time PCR machines. Okay, it is the result, everyone know that. And another thing is the antibody detections. At first, um, our hospital didn't um, think about taking the um, antibody detection test to our hospital. But um, for Thailand right now, I think um, since our case is very, very low, so maybe antibody detection is also one of the choice if you would like to check for the um, um, antibody development from um, the previous infected person or anyone that maybe say in the same house that um, maybe they develop antibody without any symptoms. So um, we decided to, do, um, to use the IgA and IgG to confirm each other. So it is just um, two of the tests that are um, launching our hospital right now. And another thing is the antibody um, detection rapid test we already used in uh, one hospital, Tulalongkorn Hospital. They um, try to do the um, one-stop service um, COVID center, and then they do the test kit, okay, for the people who would like to um, check for the antibody. And then um, if it is positive, they confirm again by the molecular method. 
and um, if it is um, negative, as you know, maybe it is um, not positive at that time. So maybe we ask the patient to come back again if they develop any symptoms, okay? And we also have a kind of, we call the telemedicine service that can um, let the patients not to go to the hospital, but they can consult if they uh, develop any um, symptoms or even the mental service, if they would like to um, consult for anything with their doctors. Okay, that's all for Thailand, but I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Wow. <clears throat> Thank you, Dr. Porcelain. That was fantastic. A nice, nice usage of multiple assays. That's, that's, I really like that a lot. That's fantastic. And I do have some very, very keen questions for you, but I'll loop back yes. uh, once we hear from Dr. Nguyen from Vietnam. If you could please uh, share with us your thoughts and experiences from uh, your center there in Vietnam. So, uh, Dr. Pornsawan, if you could stop sharing your screen. Okay. And, uh -huh, great. Yes. And then, uh, Dr. Nguyen, I believe that our ECHO team is going to share your slides. Yeah, so huh. yes. oh, there we go. So, Dr. Nguyen, when you when you are ready, please uh, let us share your experiences with us. Could you help me to the move a slide? Yep, we can do it. Okay. Yes. Uh, I I'm very happy to share with you the some the achievement of Vietnam that in the control uh, of a. Uh, COVID-19, the epidemic, uh, as well as the, the result of uh, SARS-CoV-2 testing in Vietnam. Next slide, please. Uh, this slide shows you the, the number of uh, new cases uh, of uh, COVID uh, detected uh, every, in Vietnam by day uh, within the four months from the 1st January, of, uh, 1st of January to the end of uh, April. And, um, there are the two phases of the COVID epidemic in Vietnam. The first way, the, the first way the, with um, about the 16 cases uh, and almost uh, related to the, the original cluster the, in China. And uh, we have a phase two, the, the second phase uh, early the, of uh, March. And uh, even the number of uh, confirmed cases in Vietnam is not high. But you, in this slide, you can see that there are the many the activities that we already the carry out the, to control the epidemic the in Vietnam. And um, next slide, please. And this slide shows you the, uh, our government strategy the, for the COVID-19 epidemic the control. And the, in the, the second one, uh, to for surveillance uh, of uh, epidemic uh, in community that uh, you can see the testing that uh, is a very, very important uh, component. And uh, next slide, please. And uh, this slide show you the update about the number of uh, COVID-19 cases in Vietnam uh, to accumulate that number to, to the, the end of uh, April. And uh, we have a total of uh, 270, 270 uh, confirmed cases. And uh, to find the uh, 270 confirmed cases, uh, we already did uh, to perform the surveillance and uh, uh, test about uh, more, more than uh, 200,000 uh, suspected cases. Next slide, please. So the Related to the test based SARS CoV 2 in Vietnam, that we have uh, several kinds of guidelines. And uh, who will be tested for the SARS CoV 2? You can find the definition of uh, suspected case uh, in different guidelines for the surveillance and uh, another guideline for diagnosis, treatment, and management of uh, COVID 19 patients in the health facility. And uh, until now, the, we focus on focus the testing for SARS-CoV-2 for the suspected cases, and the criteria the, for suspected cases that already specified the, in the national guideline. And um, we confirm case by the the reason of the SARS-CoV-2 the positive the, by the 
tested by the confirmatory lab uh, who certifies uh, by the Ministry of Health and uh, to manage the uh, of uh, COVID case uh, in the facility, health facility, the, we perform the test uh, SARS-CoV-2 every two to the four days uh, until the getting negative result. And the patient will be discharged when they have two consecutive uh, tests uh, with a sample uh, taken 24 hours apart, at least uh, negative uh, for SARS-CoV-2. And uh, this is the one point we really want to discuss with you, whether the, we should use uh, uh, green time RT-PCR assay for the follow-up of a patient in health facility. Because so far that we have many cases that have to stay in hospital for a long time until they get the negative the RNA for the group two before the discharge. Next slide, please. And how to test the SARS-CoV-2 that we, we can find the regulation in the national guideline for testing. And uh, in this uh, regulation, in this uh, document, we can find the type of a specimen that should be collected uh, for testing. And we can find the, the protocol. Uh, uh, and we recommend uh, to use the uh, RT-PCR protocol uh, introduced uh, by WHO or CDC. And we also provide the instruction to how to select the green time RT-PCR test kit and we recommend that we should select and we should use the test is qualified by the international organization such as the WHO, FDA, or the qualified by and licensed by Ministry of Health in Vietnam. Uh, additionally, the, in the, our national guideline, we provide the requirement for the screening and confirmatory laboratory at about the human resources, about the equipment, about the infrastructure, and about the biosafety level yeah, before the, they perform and uh, develop the capacity for uh, COVID uh, testing. Next slide, please. And this slide shows you the molecular test that widely used in Vietnam. And at the beginning of the epidemic, because we do not have so much protocol and so much commercial test kits, and we select the protocol developed by the Virology Institute in Berlin, and we specified what kind of variation, brand name of variation, and the consumables should be used in this protocol. And the second one is, is select a protocol developed by CDC. In Vietnam, we do not have a test kit that developed by CDC, but we applied the protocol that developed by CDC with the, the material, with the reason that already specified in this protocol to maintain the quality, the testing, the quality. And um, in response to the COVID the epidemic in Vietnam, there are some group, uh, research group, and some companies working together to develop the, our local test kits. And uh, we have a very, very wonderful uh, test kit ready to use, uh, developed by one company in Vietnam. Yeah, it is uh, based on the, uh, based on the real time the RT-PCR, yes. And um, now this test kit uh, is ready to you, it means that uh, everything that makes it in one tube. So the, the lab, after extraction of RNA, the, the technician only need the, to put the, some the microlid of the RNA extract the, into the tube, already contain the, everything, the primer probe and the master mix and the put in the real time the machine. And the, it's very, very convenient the, for the use and the, suitable the, with the, the lab the, at the, the province the, when the, the technicians do not have uh, so much uh, experience uh, for the molecular testing. Next slide, please. And uh, this slide show you the, how we the scan up the, our capacity the, for testing the 
COVID-19 in Vietnam. And uh, to control of uh, COVID epidemic in Vietnam, we based on the, our the communicable the surveillance system already the existing the in Vietnam. And uh, we established so far with the, in the ministry in the health sector, so far we have a 96 lab that can do, can perform the COVID the testing. And mainly the, in the national institute, university or national hospital. And there are the some lab that at the CDC, province the CDC center and particularly that in the Hanoi or Ho Chi Minh city and big city and have a border that, and have a border. And the, from the Ministry of Agriculture, we already have a, a ETLA. And from Ministry of Defense, we also have a ETLA. And the, minister, the lab that under Ministry of Defense are responsible to provide testing the, for the people in the centralized uh, quarantine area. And uh, so the, we quickly the scan up the, our capacity the, for the COVID-19 testing. Next slide, please. And uh, that at some point that I really want to discuss with you the, on this meeting. The first thing is the uh, evaluation of uh, diagnostic screening test for the novel infectious disease such as COVID-19. And because uh, uh, for developer and also for user, we do not have a golden standard for new the infection disease. And the second thing that at the beginning of the epidemic, the clinical sample is very, very limited. And uh, it is a difficulty than for both the user and also for developer. That's why that sometimes the, we the refer the information resources, but uh, the, the performance the characteristic, the evaluation by developer also very, very limited. So that we not so much have a confidence on the specificity and the uh, sensitivity and the detection limit of uh, uh, test kits that develop and the stated by developer or manufacturer. And the second thing that I already mentioned that in the, our previous slide that the, the way or the, which method or which test we should use to manage or follow up the COVID-19 confirmed cases in the healthcare facility. If we only base on the real-time artificial test, yes, until the patient getting the negative result, many patients have to take a long time to, to wait the negative result for this chart. And the last thing I want to dis discuss is the selection and use of uh, immunoassay for COVID-19 surveillance particularly in Vietnam, when we do not have so much case, confirmed case, the number of case is very low. Our situation is completely that we ever have a pandemic, yes. Thank you so much for the attention. Wow, thank, thank you very much, Dr. Nguyen. That was a really great and very informative presentation on the uh, activities in the labs in Vietnam. Thank you very much for that. So, uh, well, great. Uh, I think now we'll switch to the questions and answers session. Uh, it's, thank you everyone for uh, keeping lots of time for hopefully an invigorating discussion. I know I'm certainly jazzed hearing all this great diagnostic talk. It's super, super great. Uh, so I think actually, Dr. Nguyen, I'm going to ask a question to you first because you had that nice slide where you talked about many different labs around the country where you were uh, managing and testing patients and ever suspected cases, sorry. Uh, and I was wondering, uh, how have you gone about implementing a training program so that you know, the assays you're rolling out, so either the, the uh, uh, Berlin protocol or the CDC reagents that I understand you're, are your new uh, uh, light, sorry, I lost the name, light power assay. 
Could you talk to us about the training uh, of that staff? And then are there discussions between your group and the Ministry of Agriculture and Defense to make sure there's a unified platform in your country for testing? Yeah, yes. Um, at the beginning of the outbreak, uh, our institute, the NIHA, the responsible to, to develop the protocol the, uh, and to perform the evaluation the, of a protocol. And uh, as I already uh, presented, we select the protocol that developed by the Biology Institute in Germany. And uh, when we can order the primer pro and the other the reaction and master mix, we perform the um, evaluation at our NIHE. And after that, uh, we develop the SOP and training program. And we provide the training the, for the local lab and uh, rolling out. First, we select the, some the, um, critical lab, the, for example, the CDC Hanoi, and the, some, the, some the province that have a border with the China, like uh, Quang Ninh, the CDC province. And uh, we also have a local uh, on-site training for the local lab. And uh, we also provide the sample panel for the perform proficiency the evaluation before the, they can the provide the testing the by themselves. Thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, so Dr. Uh, uh, Ponsawan, uh, I have a question for you about your antibody testing. And I think this came up in Dr. Wynn's discussion as well about uh, and there are other questions regarding this topic. We know that as patients recover, the real-time mm -hmm. assays, because they're so sensitive, are very likely to pick up uh, fragments of genome, but, but unlikely to be infectious virus. And I'm wondering if in your country, are you using the serological assays to help you inform when you can discharge, discharge or you take a patient out of hospital and send them home safely? Are, are, is that how you're using those assays, or are there thoughts for that amongst us? And, and if others have thoughts on that as well, Dr. Sachs or others, please please share. Thank you. Yeah, uh, if it's our plan, if it's our future plan, because um, last month we still don't have the um, any antibody test kit available in the market because um, they all have to send to uh, MOPH Thailand to an FDA Thailand to test for the efficiency, efficacy, everything, sensitivity, specificity. So we still don't have the ELISA test kit, but uh, we just um, got it yesterday. So it is our plan to use it together. Yeah, because uh, last time, as everyone know, we used just the real-time PCR to, I mean, as the criteria for the patient to discharge. Yeah, so it, yeah, burden a lot for, the, for us and also the patient to stay in the hospital for a long time. Yeah, so after that, we try to combine it together, whether, okay, antibody already rise and the uh, real-time PCR CT cycles already decrease, almost um, touch the threshold, I mean, the, the cutoff criteria. So yeah, we plan to use it together oh, in the future. Yeah, 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 of course, I think that's, that's great. And while I have you, Dr. Ponsawan, could you talk a bit more about your app? I thought that was a very interesting innovation uh, because if we do test a patient negative, uh, yeah. And you have the app where if they become symptomatic again, they could report that back to you. Could you talk just a bit more about that? I thought that was an interesting uh, uh, technology. You mean the, the antibody um, rapid test, right? And the, the symptom? No, it was more the telemedicine application, the telemedicine. Oh, yeah, yeah, the telemedicine, right? Yes, mm -hmm. yes, okay, okay. Um, actually, it is not the complicated thing. Just um, we um, ask the patients to, I mean, download applications that uh, they all say, okay, they may contact us, they can chat with us. And also the telemedicine means uh, you can call us anytime that you, I mean, have um, some kind of developing of the symptoms. And um, so we can contact each other, okay, um, after okay, they have the blood test and we may, okay, call back to check whether another three days they're still fine, don't have any symptoms, okay, if it's fine, it's okay. But also in the same time, they also can have our contact, so they can contact back anytime. It's a kind of open chat that we 
can, I mean, um, continue talking to the patients and at the same time, they can call us to, I mean, report if they have any um, symptoms develop later. Yeah, uh, thanks. Thanks for that. I think that's very important. Uh, I know we're on talking about diagnostics, but uh, in diagnostics, we test people and people mm -hmm. matter or animals matter. And keeping track of their how they're feeling or how they if they get sick again and the psychosocial aspects of that are very important and something we shouldn't neglect. Um, turning to Dr. Sachs for a bit more of a technical question, I guess uh, both Dr. Wynn and Dr. Pornsawan mentioned they used multiple targets in their real-time assays, so multiple gene targets. And I'm wondering if you could give us an overview. I've seen a few questions come in about. Uh, why use two or more targets to help uh, confirm your laboratory diagnosis? Great, thanks. And I think this is particularly relevant in the Asian region. Um, so the e-gene, which is the generally the target that many of the assays um, look for, um, is not necessarily specific to, to SARS-CoV-2. It can cross-react with some of the other coronaviruses. Um, and so because of that, um, it is recommended to do the e-gene as well as the RDRP. That was the first um, protocol that was released from Berlin. Um, there are now many other targets of uh, molecular tests, such as the S-gene, the ORF1. Um, but generally, the reason two targets are recommended um, is to ensure that you have a true positive as opposed to a false positive. Um, this becomes even more uh, um, important as your prevalence falls. So um, no matter how good a test is, as your prevalence falls, you're going to get a higher proportion of false positives compared to true positives. So your positive predictive value will go down. Um, and thus by having two targets and having to um, get two positives in order to confirm that one result, you um, increase the likelihood that the person you're diagnosing truly has the virus. Um, so uh, that's a brief reason why having two targets is generally considered better than one. Um, this will vary regionally, and there are many tests that we've evaluated um, that do target just one gene, um, and they perform quite well. Uh, th thank you for that. I'm wondering also, Dr. Sachs, if you could speak to the development or the coming online of the antibody tests and the immunoassays and uh, talk a bit more about that because I, I feel myself and I'm sure others here feel that th those will be a very essential piece of this uh, puzzle uh, to help us understand the scope of the outbreak. Yeah. Sure. So um, there uh, I feel like every day there are more and more antibody tests that are uh, becoming available that are specific for SARS-CoV-2. Um, how well those tests work is, is a question. Um, but I think um, when we want to fully understand how widely this disease has spread in a particular area, having access to antibody detection is really critical. Um, for to gain that prevalence understanding. I think um, what's challenging for SARS-CoV-2 is that we are having to um, design testing strategies at the same time that we're learning about the basic biology of this infection. So um, the timing and the kinetics of the development of the antibody response, how durable it is, whether if you have antibodies, you are indeed protected from reinfection. These are all active research questions. And so we're having to come up with clinical um, care decisions in the absence of um, fully fledged out understanding of this virus. But I think there are a few um, basic biological questions that have been pretty well answered in the past month or so. Um, we know that antibodies develop to both the uh, nucleocapsin as well as the spike protein of the virus. And it's expected that the antibodies that are specific to that spike protein um, which is required for viral entry into the host cell, are probably going to be the more protective um, antibodies. So when you, if you um, are starting to consider in your testing program to um, understand if someone is immune from reinfection, you might want to select an antibody test that targets that S protein. Mm -hmm. um, on the other hand, we know that um, the majority of the antibody response is actually to the nucleocapsid. So if you want an, a test that tells you 
whether someone has mounted an immune response to the virus and whether they were previously exposed to it, um, perhaps having a test that's specific to those that nucleocapsid will be your best bet. Um, so, but we don't know how long those antibodies stick around. So um, if, if you test negative, even though you were exposed maybe a few months ago, we don't know whether that's because immunity waned or because you never developed an antibody. And I think some of those longitudinal studies are still being done. Um, finally, I think I saw, uh, I think one of the presenters raised this issue of not having a gold standard. Um, so for the antibody tests in particular, we, we really are in a position where we don't have a gold standard assay, nor do we have gold standard uh, reference materials yet that are widely available. And so I think there's always going to be some uncertainty with the accuracy of these tests. But um, because this uh, virus is so widely spread in many different countries, um, you know, the level of research and, and the activity of research is, is quite prominent. So I think you'll probably see over the course of the next three weeks to a month, um, a lot more information that becomes available on the antibody tests because they do seem to be critical as countries think about reopening up again. Yes, indeed. I think they will be a, a very key piece to this uh, puzzle. Uh, I, I have a question back to Dr. Wynn and then to Dr. Poinsuan. Uh, we are, we all, everyone on this call are struggling with supply chain issues and how do we get reagents and test kits? And I see from Philippe a practical question about even collection tubes and swabs and all the things that uh, we've come to rely on to do good laboratory diagnostics. And Dr. Wynn, could you speak to how uh, you in Vietnam are trying to work through the supply chain, the, the, the efforts you're putting in and strategies you have to get the tests that you need to diagnose the patients? Well, I think you're on mute, Dr. Wynn. Oh. Huh. And it is a bigger issue for every country, not only the, for Vietnam, to in this the epidemic. And uh, I think it, this point already, the, Dr. Sharp already the mentioned in her the presentation the, how to select uh, and how to decide the test kit. And the, in Vietnam, the, as I told you, even the, when the, we, the, uh, we recommend to use the protocol the, developed by W by the um, uh, Biology Institute the Berlin or the protocol developed by CDC and in the SOP we specified uh, what kind of uh, material and uh, reaction we should use we should use but because of shortage and the problem of a supply sometimes we have to uh, replace the another reagent, another master kit that uh, available in the market of, of Vietnam. Mm -hmm. And so compare uh, uh, this uh, product uh, with the product uh, recommended uh, by the protocol developer or, uh, yes. And if the performance of the test is uh, the same, we will decide that we will replace the uh, reagent recommended uh, by developer. So that's, it is a very, very important way that to the maintain the supplies for testing. We have a solution for replacement of uh, material and reagent. Mm, yeah. Uh, Dr. Ponsawan, do you have anything to add on the supply chain side of things? Okay. Right. Um, in, in Thailand, luckily, I think at the first phase of um, pandemic, we stock a lot of reagents. But uh, our case in, in, um, in the country is not, I mean, increased. So right now we don't face, um, I mean, about the problem for the supply and reagent. But sometimes we still have a problem with the PPE. Yeah, so we, um, sometimes we have to reuse the mask or in 95 by using the uh, UV, um, block, UV box to, mm -hmm. I mean, um, decontaminate a um, kind of PPE. Or sometimes if the cover all, I mean, we lack of the cover all, we can use the raincoat instead, I think like that, we apply for that. And another thing that um, caused a problem to us is the swab, and I mean the, the VTM and the swab mm -hmm. uh, for the patient to collect the samples. Um, sometimes we can buy the swab, but we cannot buy, buy the VTM. 
So sometimes we prepare the VTM by ourselves in our lab. Yeah, we mix the medium with the antibiotic thing like that, and we um, buy only the um, swab things for the nasal and um, throat swab. And another thing that we think um, is that if we um, can take the um, RNA from the saliva, so it's no need for the swab and the VTM at all. So now we try to, I mean, compare the saliva detection, the sputum, as well as the swab. If we can um, ask for all specimen from the same patients and we compare to each other. Um, right now at the, um, the symptom durations, we found that the saliva is also okay. Yeah, and in the list of infection, sometimes sputum is better than the swab thing. Yeah, so um, it is uh, our, the other option, just in case that we lack of all of the swab and the VTM, yeah is um, the thing that we face for right now. That's great. Thank you for that perspective because it, it is this pandemic has really shown us how important our supply chains are. Uh, I think generally even I've worked very large outbreaks in Western Africa but getting materials was just getting them there. You needed the plane or the boat. You didn't, they weren't, they were available. You just could not get them there. Uh, this is a different situation where we have to be creative I think uh, like you're switching from uh, a swab to just sputum and other saliva samples, uh, as long as we can cross validate that those are as equivalent uh, in these pressing issues right. and emergencies. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, Dr. Smita Ghosh has joined us uh, from CDC. She had a question or two. Uh, one, uh, I'll let her ask her questions. We're trying to do the community of practice thing. I, I should stop talking and more other people should start talking. So, uh, Dr. Ghosh, please. This was a fantastic session. Thank you so much for the presentations and it was great hearing experiences from Vietnam and, and, um, and uh, Thailand. Um, I had two questions. One uh, is uh, uh, just experiences using uh, Gene Expert. Have people been using it? I think somebody from Myanmar said that they have not been using it. Um, what, is, what is happening? I'm not a laboratorian, I'm an epidemiologist, so I was just curious as to what is happening in different countries about um, use of gene expert for mm. COVID-19 testing, um, and that, that could be shared. Mm. And then if we had time later, um, I wanted to hear about um, whole genome sequencing. I've not been following literature at all. So if others have, especially Dr. Sachs or others, you know, how many strains are there have been identified? I knew about two earlier on, but I haven't followed the literature yet. Um, and then do we know anything about the mutation rates um, of this virus or not? Okay. Uh, well, let's turf it out to, the, to, the, to our participants. Let's try that. Let's, uh, so is anyone on the line that's listening in use the Cepheid Gene Experts uh, or platform in diagnosing uh, patients uh, in your clinics? If anyone has an experience with that, please share. Um, anyone? Yeah. This is uh, Michael Larry in, uh, in Vietnam. I'm also not a laboratory person, so I, I can't speak very specifically, but we've been looking at the possibility of, of uh, introducing the COVID-19 cartridges into the existing gene expert platform, which is available through the National TB program. Mm -hmm. um, so that's, we're just uh, underway with discussions on that, but one of the key concerns is the fact, is the supply chain issue that you're raising. It seems that the, um, the cartridges may not even though we have, I think, some funds to purchase them, they may not be available for some months. So we're looking at that, but uh, it's not gone anywhere specifically so far. Yeah. Uh, thank you for that, Dr. O'Leary. Any, anyone else uh, been trying to use the gene experts? Uh, in Vietnam, the, we have a TB control program, and uh, for many years, uh, we already used the gene expert uh, instrument for the in the TB control program. Mm -hmm. And um, to prevent for the, some kind of scenario of uh, COVID-19 epidemic. And we also have a plan to bring uh, the experts the in use uh, for the COVID-19 testing if uh, uh, the epidemic of uh, COVID-19 in the Vietnam the, cannot be the stop. No. Yeah. And, uh, but the, I think the problem is the supply of uh, test kits. 
for the experts that at the beginning because the the, the number of the test kits the first that only use subscription to be used in the US and uh, about the regulation only used in US and not the exports to other countries. Yes. Thank you for that. Let's think about the, uh, if maybe Dr. Sachs wants to talk a bit about the whole genome sequencing efforts, if you can. If not, maybe someone else on the line can share their experiences. I was going to give someone else an opportunity because oh, I, yeah, um, sure. I, right. it's, yeah, no it's not my area of expertise. <laughs> um. uh, so has, has anyone in our community of, of friends and colleagues here been using uh, either uh, probably nanopore type sequencers or other uh, platforms to generate uh, genomes? So we've, there's certainly many, many genomes present on the nextstrain.org uh, tracker and in GISAID, the major database from which things are pulled. Has anyone here used those platforms at all? We have a plan to use the Nanopore, the platform for mm -hmm. the SARS-CoV-2, the genome, whole genome, the analysis. We already did the other material the, before the epidemic, but the, the problem is the, now that we cannot the, receive a delivery from the Nanopore the company in the UK. Yes. Mm -hmm. and. Um, to analyze the um, SARS-CoV-2, the genome, the, we really want to compare the isolate the, from the first way that we have a case of, yeah, imported from the original cluster the, in China and uh, compare with the isolate the, from the people coming back from the other areas, such as the, from the US, the, from the other countries the, in the Europe. Yes, I will say with you, we all of use the information and the other data when the, we receive uh, uh, nanopore instrument and uh, reagent. I hope that, that we can complete uh, this analysis now within the two months later. Yeah, that, that's great. Yeah, it's, it's fascinating your two waves of infection that you've tracked very nicely. It appears, uh, you know, the initial blip of cases and then this larger uh, wave that's uh, now tailing off there. Definitely the usage of uh, Nanopore and Illumina and other whole genome sequencing efforts uh, in this outbreak have really revolutionized our understanding of how viruses, in this case a virus, moves around the world. And uh, if, if, if people are not familiar, uh, Dr. Adele uh, put in the chat the link to nextstrain.org and I highly recommend everyone here, since we're focused on laboratory diagnostics and understanding insights into viral uh, uh, diagnosis, but also evolution and how these viruses spread epidemiologically to look at that website. Not only is it a wonderful compendium of genetic sequence information, uh, but they have excellent uh, situation reports where they analyze and give their opinions on how clusters of viruses have moved around the globe. It's, it's a really fantastic resource and a true testament to the power of that technology in these types of outbreaks. Um, so I, I have a, see a question here from Dr. Carrie McNeil, one of my colleagues at Sandia National Labs in the United States. So thanks, Carrie, for joining. It's wonderful to see your question here. And I think it's relevant, uh, th this question, in, in my experience working in Ebola outbreaks, uh, that those emergencies take the attention of everyone and everything. And this current pandemic for COVID-19 is doing the same. Right? We're all here working to try to figure out how best to diagnose COVID-19 patients. Uh, and, and Dr. McNeil's question is about, has the limitations and the demands on the testing infrastructure in your countries limited the ability to test for other diseases? Uh, so uh, I'll just, uh, maybe Dr. Pornsawan, if you want to talk about that, if you have any insights, we'll start with you and then we'll open it up to the community here of, of, of friends and practitioners. Yeah, okay. Um, right now, yeah, because um, for the infrastructure, we have to, I mean, um, adapt our laboratory. At first, it is just BSL2. But since anyway, we um, actually in our hospital, we already um, have the BSL3, but it's still under the certificate and certify. So right now, we adapt our BSL2 um, to use at the laboratory for testing, but uh, we wear the PPE 
all type SWS L3. So we call that room SWS L2 enhanced. So, and the first, um, the first time, this is the lab which already um, received the ISO for dengue. But right now we cannot use that laboratory to detect for dengue anymore because we have to do only the COVID in that room. So we have to find another room to use um, for another test. And we also think about um, the rainy season will come in soon in Thailand. So maybe we also have to face about the dengue epidemic again. So right now, yeah, the infrastructure is quite, I mean, um, has got some problem. So we have to find another place um, that um, suitable for um, detection for any other kind of um, tropical diseases instead of that room. But if we are lucky and the COVID um, test is decreased in Thailand, then maybe we can, I mean, um, we can have a fewer tests and we can um, go back to our, I mean, normal life very soon. But anyway, I, I would like to talk a little bit about um, the whole genome sequencing. Actually, it is not for the diagnostic in, in Thailand, but it um, under the investigate. Many researchers also I mean, um, talk about that. Same as in our hospital, one of the researchers plan to, I mean, do the um, sequencing um, for the sample that we got in our hospital as the baseline data. And once, if we have the physicians or any nurse or any um, one who work with the patient got infections, we plan to collect the sample from the doctor who got infection and compare with the sequence of the patients. So we cannot know that uh, whether the doctor got the infection from that patient or we got from outside, thing like that. And also, if um, the um, the one who work with the patients got, I mean accidentally infections. So we may have to think about uh, whether we have the problem about the uh, um, negative pressure in our hospital or um, anything else. So I think we can trace back um, if we have the data for both the patients or with the worker who work with the patients. It is the way that we think about the uh, um, genome sequencing to use in our hospital. Yeah, okay. that, that's, that's fantastic. I think the usage of whole genome sequencing for just that, for essentially contact tracing uh, will be very important, especially as the pandemic wanes, because in, in all of our countries, we would want to know is the new case we see that, that pops up in the future, is this a strain that has been in our country already, or is this most closely linked to a traveler coming in from the outside? And that'll be very important to how we inform and uh, actuate our emergency responses when we're getting towards the tail end of the pandemic. And we use that kind of uh, approach very much in the Ebola world uh, to try to stamp out the last chains of transmission. Uh, that's very important. Is there anyone else in our group uh, that has experiences with the COVID testing uh, that really uh, uh, decreasing your ability to test for other diseases? If there's anyone from any animal laboratories or veterinary schools that are on the line that would like to talk about it. Uh, let's just share our experiences and our, well, our pain and our difficulties, and let's try to work together and find ways we can hopefully find solutions to that. Anyone? Anyone would like to share? Okay. Well, uh, I, Brian, it's Philip here. Oh, hey, Philip, please. Oh. Yeah. I'm not in the laboratory, but SFAO have a bit of context with the animal health laboratory. Mm -hmm. So, so far, I, I think that the challenges will be the same. It's in terms of supply chain and having enough uh, reagents to perform our surveillances. So currently we don't see big breakups, but what we are fearing is like for next flu season, etc., is like when all the reagents will be prioritized to COVID. And I know, for example, Thermo Fisher is prioritizing their uh, their orders. Like if it doesn't have COVID-19 in the order, you get pushed down. So we, 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 are, we are afraid that things like H5N1 surveillance or African swine fever surveillance or, or diagnostics in parts of the world will suffer from this because there will be a competition of uh, uh, of reagents as well as uh, uh, time from from the laboratory, etc. Over. Yeah, thanks, Philip. I think that is a huge uh, concern. 
Uh, COVID-19 is obviously an incredibly important disease that has impacted the world in ways that we honestly barely anticipated uh, the, the, deep, the depth of the impacts, but there are still a huge amount of diseases that are incredibly important out in the world uh, that we need to be keeping track of. Um, so we have about, let's see, about three minutes or so left for the discussions, three or four minutes. Uh, I'm just gonna look through the questions here. Um, or perhaps would Dr. Wynn or Pornsawan or Dr. Sachs have a question they would like to pose? That would be great too, please. Could you repeat the question? Yeah, do you have a question that you would like to ask uh, your colleagues? Uh, I have, a, yes. Thank you so much. I spent sure. the last of three minutes for me. <laughs> uh, related, to, uh, related to the supply of uh, material and the reason for COVID-19 testing, uh, one problem I really want to discuss it is the uh, uh, violent transport medium. Yes, uh, we know that uh, we should use the transport, viral transport the medium the for, it is required for the virus isolation. Mm -hmm. But uh, so far, the for diagnostic, that we only use the uh, uh, RT-PCR assay to detect the viral RNA. So, the, um, and the, in the Vietnam, sometimes the, we cannot uh, buy the uh, viral transport the medium. It is the first uh, Problem and the second thing is uh, the cost of a transport medium is uh, very expensive. And uh, in Vietnam, we test uh, more than uh, two hundred uh, thousand uh, sample and can find uh, less than uh, three hundred uh, cases. And um, I really want to look for the alternative uh, medium to the reserve uh, sample cho swab, the naso swab and uh, for the RT-PCR, real-time RT-PCR the detection. I think it is the practical issue and very important and critical for the uh, limited resources, the country and the setting. And we also need the alternative that is okay, the supply of uh, viral transport the medium that discontinued in the pandemic. Yeah, so anyone have experience that to use a, a medium other than the transport medium, uh, yeah, to yeah. Form sample collection. Yeah, would anyone like to share their thoughts? I mean, VTM is a very commonly used uh, liquid media, uh, transport media, of course, uh, about how they're overcoming those challenges. Yeah, please. Yeah, <laughs> it's me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm sorry. I, I, I already talked about that a little bit. Yeah, I, I mentioned that a little bit. It also has that problem in our country. So uh, you can use a um, very, very cheap one. It is the medium that you, um, it is the, the, you don't have to use the liquid medium. The powder medium is fine. You prepare it to be liquid. And then I use the same thing that I use in our lab for the virus isolation. But if you prepare by yourself, it's very, very cheap. It's a lot cheaper. So you can prepare like um, the, the medium with um, the antibiotic and 2% um, of the fetobovite serum and you prepare it by yourself and you aliquot by sterile technique to the tube that can put the swab inside. Yeah, every, I mean, many times we prepare that because we also cannot, I mean, receive the VTM on time. Yeah, so we buy only the um, swab thing, but we prepare the VTM by ourselves. Yeah, you can use the same a formula as the medium that you use in the lab for the virus isolations, same thing. Great, thanks. Uh, Philip, I think you've got a comment. I see your hand. Yeah, yeah. Sorry. Yeah. I, I think on the animal health side, as we're doing so much high throughput surveillance for avian influenza, swine influenza before, we have this experience. I think most of the animal labs also in Vietnam, all the Rajos, they will have experience in making their VTM themselves. And that will be 50 times to 100 times, oh, to 80 times cheaper than the ones that you buy. Mm -hmm. So, and, and for sure, the animal health laboratories will have those SOPs. So maybe you can ask uh, Raho or NCVD in Vietnam to share their VTM protocols and how they prepare them to Nihe. Over. Yeah, thanks, wow. thanks for that. That's great. And I think uh, one consideration in all of that is to as be advocates for yourselves as diagnosticians, I think, in that 
uh, many times we know how to create these reagents and, and can get them done and made if we have critical shortages, but speak to your regulatory authorities once the emergency has calmed down to find ways that that can then be an officially approved method. Because uh, that's important, especially on the human diagnostic side and testing for high consequence animal pathogens. You want to make sure you as the laboratory worker or, or staff are uh, in compliance with whatever regulations might be in your country. Um, let's see, so we got a couple more minutes. Uh, one question that came up that I saw pop up a couple times is talking about pooling of samples. So we spent a lot of time talking about, well, we can't get the reagents because the supply chain is terrible. Uh, there's no swabs and there's no tubes and there's barely any reagent. Uh, is it possible or if people tried to pool samples, so take specimens from five patients, say, and mix them together and test them as one? Uh, this is commonly done in some research settings uh, in some of my work, but I'm wondering from our diagnostic friends, have you attempted that and what are your experiences with that? Um, anyone like to add on pooling if you've tried that? I think, Brian, that uh, Eric Carlson at the Institute Pasteur in Cambodia has been working a little bit with that, but I have to double check because uh, mm -hmm. he has been checking the various protocols, WHO, CDC. We have some isothermal uh, platforms there as well. So, and I, I know he has been doing dilution series as well as, as like uh, patient uh, or raw samples so we, we I, I might check with him whether he did some pooling i think he might have done overall when we did it with avian influenza or other like african swine fever or other viruses of course it's not uh, sars cov2 but overall we see no problems with pooling uh, up to five samples five six samples that that's a general rule of thumb that we use for viral diseases is up to five we you, you can see a CT drop like two, three, so a tenfold uh, drop in, in sensitivity when you go up to five, six, but overall that weighs out uh, the, the costs analysis that you have. The only thing that you have to take in mind is when you pull, we always, uh, we always recommend to pull in the laboratory rather than in the field because then you still have the individual sample to go back to which is very important for trace back and trace forward because elsewhere you don't know which of your five people can be infected over thanks thanks philip that's great uh dr Wen, did i see your hand up for a moment for a comment on uh pooling or, or dr porcelain no okay okay uh well we're uh pr pretty much at the end of the q a session i'd like to thank everybody this has been a great a great discussion. It's really fantastic. That's how these are supposed to be. So please, uh, next time in two weeks when we join in, throw out your, your questions and your comments. This is fantastic because really we're here to learn from each other. And uh, it's only together that we figure out these problems, right? Uh, we all live in our own worlds and our own work, uh, but it's the strength of all of us together as a One Health workforce that really makes this shine. So uh, with that, I'll turn it back, I guess, to maybe Dr. Smith for closing comments uh, and Dr. Vita. Thank you very much. Enjoyed it very much. Thank you. Yeah, thanks to everyone for being here. I think uh, we, we had a very nice discussion. Of course, there's many additional things we would love to talk about. So we can continue that um, online a bit. Uh, there is an FAQ page that we have created associated with this series. And um, so that's a place where we can post additional information in the coming days to help keep everyone connected. The, um, the next session that we'll be having in two weeks will focus on some of the immunity issues and interventions for COVID-19 that are currently being talked about. So just a sneak peek, we'll have the chance to talk about some of the questions that came up related to immunity and interventions again at that time in two weeks from now. Um, but really this was very lovely to hear from everyone and to hear some of the challenges and to talk through some of that together. We actually came up with some nice solutions that could be very practical. So um, I'm happy about that. I'd like to turn it over to Pat for any final comments he might like to make. And then we'll go to Bruce for finishing up with our Socian codes and his perspective. So just, just a word of, of thanks uh, to everyone, especially all the, the speakers uh, who share their experiences and you know all the active participants uh, from the uh, 
that dialing in uh, for for today. So we look forward uh, for you to joining us back uh, in two weeks. So please feel free to submit uh, the question earlier uh, so that our panelists can address that along and you know uh, participate in the active discussions. So with that, uh, I turn the uh, mic back to Bruce uh, for the uh, the final <clears throat> touch base of you know how you get the CME credits and other things. Great, thank you, Pat, and, and thanks to all the presenters and all the participants. As Brian and, and Bautrina said, it was a fabulous interactive discussion. Looking forward to more of these dynamic dialogues. So I'm going to share the end QR code, but before I do that, I just want to encourage everyone who would like continuing professional development credits to uh, follow the link that we put in the chat or what was in the uh, announcement that went out. And we really want your feedback so we can continue to improve these learning sessions. And I will keep, keep this code up for a few minutes and uh, stay after the end of the session if anyone uh, needs help with the PDA participant app. So with that, just wishing everyone well, be safe and take care and look forward to seeing you in two weeks. Excellent. Thank you. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye-bye.